Welcome back to the Agentic School Manifesto. This is Chapter 8, The Hazards of the Exclusion Delusion. The default concepts that dominate schooling today are not going to go quietly into the night. They are going to fight to retain their power and influence. However, we are not on a mission to eradicate them. Our mission is to prevent them from suppressing other concepts that can enable us to more fully grasp the complex realities of learning, teaching, and schooling. All sides to the debates about education get at least one thing right and a lot of other things wrong. I take the differences of opinion expressed in the debates to be irreconcilable only insofar as the debaters insist on the incompatibility of their views. Those who insist on incompatibility are suffering from the exclusion delusion, which I will explain shortly. And I believe that the seeming incompatibility of competing views is a significant contributor to the swings of the political pendulum in education and the utter lack of effective reform at the system's level. To begin to understand how this can be true, let's start with a famous poem from 1872 by a fellow named John Godfrey Sachs. The poem is called The Blind Man and the Elephant, a Hindu fable, though versions of the tale it tells were also found in the Buddhist, Jain, and Sufi traditions as well. It was six men of Indostan, to learning much inclined, who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, that each, by observation, might satisfy his mind. The first approached the elephant, and happening to fall against his broad and sturdy side, at once began to bawl, God bless me! But the elephant is very like a wall. The second, feeling of the tusk, cried, Oh, what have we here? So very round and smooth and sharp. To me, tis mighty clear, this wonder of an elephant is very like a spear. The third approached the animal, and happening to take the squirming trunk within his hands, thus boldly up and spake, I see quoth he. The elephant is very like a snake. The fourth reached out his eager hand and felt about the knee. What most this wondrous beast is like is mighty plain, quoth he. Tis clear enough the elephant is very like a tree. The fifth, who chanced to touch the ear, said, In the blindest man can tell what this resembles most. Deny the fact you can. This marvel of an elephant is very like a fan. The sixth no sooner had begun about the beast to grope than seizing on the swinging tail that fell within his scope. I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a rope. And so these men of Indostan disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion, exceeding stiff and strong though each was partly in the right, and all were in the wrong. So, oft in theologic wars, the disputants, I ween, rail on in utter ignorance of what each other mean, and prate about an elephant not one of them has seen. Alongside the poem on page 49 is a cartoon illustration that shows the six men in black suits with blindfolds on all around the elephant. The first man, who is touching the side of the elephant, is on a ladder, and his speech bubble shows a photograph of a stone wall. The second man, who is touching the tusk, is standing on a three-legged stool, and his speech bubble shows a photograph of the metal tip of a spear. The third man, who is touching the trunk, is actually draped over the trunk as it hangs low to the ground and curls in toward the elephant's front legs. His speech bubble shows a photograph of a snake. The fourth man is partly underneath the elephant behind the front leg closest to us, and his speech bubble shows a photo of the trunk of a tree. The fifth man is on top of the elephant in a riding position just behind its head. His speech bubble shows a photograph of a fan woven from large lightly colored grass blades. The sixth man is also standing on a three-legged stool to reach the elephant's short tail. His speech bubble shows a photo of a light colored hemp rope. 
On page 50, there is another illustration called the blind men and the elephant, a Venn diagram. There are six ovals that intersect. The photos from the speech bubbles from the previous illustration occupy the outer half of each of the ovals. The center of the diagram, where all six ovals overlap, contains the photo of an elephant. Back to the text. Now, I want you to notice a few things that can help us explore our understanding of truth. Let's be clear that this poetic presentation addresses a fundamental human challenge. It is a distillation of the problem of taking a perspective versus having perfect objectivity. Let's use another variation on this theme to examine how this works. The illustration on page 51 depicts three different shadows cast by a hidden object. The title of the illustration is The Mystery of Education Illustrated. The central picture shows three translucent squares that meet in the center like the faces of a cube. There are three lights that illuminate the hidden object in a way that casts a clear shadow on each of the translucent faces. There is a light below the hidden object that casts a circular shadow on the upper face. There is a light above and to the left of the hidden object that casts a triangular shadow on the right face. There is a light above and to the right of the hidden object that casts a square shadow on the left face. There are three human faces that are each observing one face of the box. Each human face also has a speech bubble, though I will only share part of them for now and reveal the rest later. The face above is looking down and his speech bubble says it's a sphere. The face on the lower left is looking up on the left face and her speech bubble says it's a pyramid. The face to the lower right is looking up on the right face and his speech bubble says it's a cube. There is a box at the bottom that says these three folks were asked to guess the shape of the three-dimensional object hidden within this box. Each person currently sees one side of the box. The object is lit to cast shadows for observation. Back to the text. The challenge is to understand what three-dimensional object simultaneously casts all three of those shadows. Three scientists propose solutions based on their observations. The one looking down from above proposes that it is the shadow of a sphere. The second looking up from below and to the left says that it is the shadow of a cube. And the third looking up from below and to the right claims that it is the shadow of a pyramid. They have each made true observations, yet they have all arrived at false conclusions. If they were politicians today, they would be encouraged to ardently defend their conclusions and mercilessly attack the others. If they don't get their way, then someone on their side will suggest that there must be a conspiracy afoot. However, since they are scientists, they would first make every effort to discern true from false observations, though in this thought experiment, each of their observations is true. Then they would endeavor to figure out how to reconcile the various true observations to arrive at a plausible but not necessarily final interpretation of the observed facts to generate some true statements about the phenomena in question. For the geometric object revealed on page 52, this would be relatively simple. The illustration is entitled The Mystery of Education Solved by Self-Determination Theory. The same drawn elements from the prior illustration are present except that they have been flipped around 180 degrees so that we can see the round square wedge shaped object, which I realize is surprisingly difficult to visualize, which is a great reason to join Deeper Learning Advocates to see it for yourself. Each of the lights now have labels, which I will reveal later. There is a fourth person in the upper right with a speech bubble that says, you're each right about one aspect, but wrong to dismiss the aspects you aren't seeing. It is all of those simultaneously. Finally, the text at the bottom reads, the truth is that they all made true and correct observations, even though the different conclusions they reached led to mutually incompatible policies and practices. They each found something that seemed to work and was compatible with their preferred interpretation of the observations they made. They overlooked the fact that other people's observations and analysis were equally valid. Back to the text. We might be able to arrive at a nearly final and complete understanding of such a simple physical object. 
Alas, for an elephant, we cannot. The poem reveals how each blind man arrived at their assertions about the nature of the elephant. The poet implicitly invites us, the audience, to feel that our sighted perspective is perfectly objective and naturally superior to each of the perspectives taken by the blind men. While we can sympathize with their unsighted perspectives, we naturally conclude that they have failed to understand the totality of an elephant. From our current scientific perspective, the notion of perfect objectivity about an elephant is absurd. When we take a scientific view, we understand that there are immensely complex structures, processes, and patterns at different levels of analysis that make up an elephant. We can never be sure that we have a final and complete understanding of any living being. Simple, solid objects, perhaps. Living beings, no way. The fact is that it is the mutual exclusivity of the views that is the real problem. To the degree that each of them meant to say, I'm right and y'all are wrong, they cut themselves off from a properly useful understanding. We shall refer to this as the exclusion delusion. The argument is that whenever we exclude a true observation from our conception, then we are necessarily reinforcing some kind of delusion about reality. Of course, there is also the challenge of distinguishing true observations from false ones, but that is a topic for another time. Let's see how the exclusion delusion is at work in education with regards to learning, teaching, and schooling. Returning to the illustration on page 51 in which the object is hidden, the face above is looking down and his speech bubble says it's a sphere of accountability by standards and testing. The face to the lower left is looking up on the left face and her speech bubble says it's a pyramid of social justice and equity. The face to the lower right is looking up on the right face and his speech bubble says it's a cube of freedom and democracy. The box at the bottom says these three folks were asked to guess the shape of the three-dimensional object hidden within the box which represents education. Back to the text. Starting off with learning, I am drawing on work by John Hattie and his colleague Nola Purdy. They did some fascinating research that revealed that there are a limited number of conceptions about learning. The conceptions were gaining information, personal change, remembering, understanding, and using information, development of social competence, and that learning is unbound by time and space. Those five were found in Western societies, but when they made their inquiries into Eastern societies, they found that they had to add a sixth item, the duty to learn. So the point I want to make here is that we have policies in schools and public policy more broadly that may be assuming that only some of these are valid. If the only thing that public policy accepts as valid learning is dutifully gaining, remembering, understanding, and using information, then that is a symptom of the exclusion delusion. The exclusion delusion in this instance is going to result in shallower learning. Only after we take all the aspects of learning seriously will we get the deeper learning that is necessary in today's world. This analysis is diagrammed in The Blind Men and the Learning on page 53. The diagram has three panels stacked vertically. The top panel shows the word learning with the same six blind men that were inspecting the elephant, inspecting the word. They each assert one of the different aspects of learning observed by Purdy and Hattie. The middle panel portrays the exclusion delusion by showing a Venn diagram of the same aspects of learning, but with personal change, development of social competence, unlimited by time and space, and duty, each negated, while gaining information and remembering, understanding, and using information remain unobscured. There is text in the upper left corner of the middle panel that says, learning is about more than just information. The center of the Venn diagram says, shallow learning. In the bottom panel, the same Venn diagram has none of the aspects obscured, and the center of the diagram says, deeper learning. Moving on to teaching, I am drawing on the work of a researcher named Daniel Pratt and his associates who cataloged conceptions of teaching, 
and arrived at five different ways of understanding it. The diagram, The Blind Men and the Teaching, is on page 54. Those ways of conceiving of teaching are delivery, nurturing, transformation, immersion, and social influence. The top panel shows the word teaching with five of the blind men inspecting the word. They each assert one of the different aspects of teaching observed by Pratt and his associates. The typical exclusion delusion for teaching is that the teacher's job is limited to the delivery of knowledge, skills, and information. The middle panel portrays this exclusion delusion by showing a Venn diagram of the same aspects of teaching, but with immersion, transformation, nurturing, and social influence each negated, while delivery remains unobscured. There is text in the upper left corner of the middle panel that says, teaching is more than just delivering knowledge, skills, and information. The center of the Venn diagram says shallow teaching. In the bottom panel, the same Venn diagram has none of the aspects obscured, and the center of the diagram says deeper teaching. As I put it in my book, Schooling for Holistic Equity, many folks dream of a little schoolhouse on the prairie in which a maidenly school marm hired by the local townsfolk delivers the three R's with a stick in one hand and a piece of chalk in the other. When delusionally oversimplified conceptions of teaching, like this, are backed by political power, then we get disastrous results in schools. Remember, there is some degree of truth underlying each conception but they create disastrous results when political forces impose one or a few conceptions to the exclusion of the other valid ways of thinking about how to educate children. The question here is, what do we get when all of the conceptions of teaching are honored? I suggest that we will get what I call a catalytic pedagogy. A pedagogy is catalytic when it has evidence showing that both teachers and students have more autonomous rather than controlled motivations, have their primary psychological needs satisfied, and are engaged more agentically, not just behaviorally. Now we turn to schooling. The diagram, The Blind Men and the Schooling, is on page 55. I have observed that there are schools across a spectrum from mainstream to radically different from that mainstream. I've been to education conferences all around the world hosted by organizations that operate in every way imaginable. The most mainstream conference was the ASCD conference, and the most radical being the International Democratic Education Conference, which recently doubled as the Summerhill Festival of Childhood. Let's bring in three scientists to observe schooling. In the top panel of the diagram, they are draped in and around the word schooling in a way similar to how the blind men were draped in and around the other two words. Sir Isaac Newton sees accountability as the most prominent feature of the mainstream. Neil deGrasse Tyson sees that there is also a significant movement to incorporate social justice into schools. Bill Nye notes that democratic education folks are strident champions of freedom. The psychologist Peter Gray has written quite a bit about how important freedom is to child development and how incompatible he believes mainstream schools to be with that view. He did some formal studies of Sudbury Valley School, which is one of the most well-known democratic schools, and also where he sent his son. The exclusion delusion is particularly strong in this case, because when schools like that are beholden to public funding sources, there is a pattern of the mainstream steadily eroding and eventually destroying schools that wear the mantle of freedom. Thus, the folks on that freedom train are reluctant to seek out that type of funding, and their schools are often relegated to serving families who can afford it. The apparent mutual exclusivity is an accurate and true observation, but that does not warrant the conclusion that the mutual exclusivity is necessary or inevitable. I propose that if we can identify the core truth behind each of these three perspectives, accountability, social justice, and freedom, then we can arrive at a logical means of rectifying the discrepancies 
to arrive at a consilient view that gives us all paths toward meaningful reform. The core truths are drawn from the primary psychological needs that all human beings have, and that have been shown to be central to the deeper learning that we expect schools to facilitate. The mainstream accountability view is anchored in the truth that all humans have the need to be competent, to perceive themselves as effective agents who pursue goals that are meaningful to both themselves and their community. Unfortunately, that truth becomes distorted by the systems of academic bookkeeping that are used as stand-ins for actual learning. The system cannot tell the difference between someone who faked their way through getting grades, test scores, certificates, and diplomas, and someone who was genuinely intrigued by their studies and mastered the lessons they were taught. Returning to the illustration on page 52 in which the object is revealed, the light casting the circular shadow is labeled illuminating competence. The social justice view is based on the universal human need for relatedness, the perception that you belong to a group and are accepted for who you are within that group. In many ways, the isolation and fragmentation occurring in our society have a disproportionate effect on those who are marginalized. Thus, the typical social justice advocate focuses on one or more of those groups. But even beyond that, the negative effects harm the non-marginalized too. Gallup data shows that the global workforce is disengaged at an average rate of 85%, that is an indication of pervasive psychological harms being done. The harms are spread across all populations, though it is true that the marginalized are harmed disproportionately more. Returning to the illustration on page 52 in which the object is revealed, the light casting the triangular shadow is labeled illuminating relatedness. The freedom view makes the primary need for autonomy a central consideration. Everyone needs to perceive themselves as the cause of their own activities and to express their will in the world. Returning to the illustration on page 52 in which the object is revealed, the light casting a square shadow is labeled illuminating autonomy. Unfortunately, schools that honor this need are extremely few and far between, and as I mentioned before, they tend to get weeded out of publicly funded systems. There are numerous models of innovation that say they are doing better at incorporating autonomy into their programs, but they mostly lack rigorous evidence to support the claim. I have developed a prototype formative assessment system, Instant Climate, which I described earlier, that can help them address this deficiency. The middle panel of the diagram portrays this exclusion delusion by showing a Venn diagram of the three aspects of schooling, but with freedom and social justice each negated, while accountability remains unobscured. There is text in the upper left corner of the middle panel that says, schooling is more than just grades, test scores, diplomas, etc. The center of the Venn diagram says, the toxic grammar of schooling. The center of the Venn diagram in the bottom panel, where all three conceptions of schooling come together, is where my work is intended to land, as shown in the Blind Men and the Schooling diagram on page 55. The text in the center says, Catalytic Pedagogy in Agentic Schools. Holistic equity is the intended outcome of catalytic pedagogy. I use the term holistic to ensure that we are talking about meeting the needs of all the humans in the system, not just some of them. Holistic education is what this is all about. The branded version of catalytic pedagogy in agentic schools is attitudinal schooling. I appreciate that there are true observations at the heart of non-holistic education systems, but holistic education is the only way to weave those truths together to make a systematic difference for children. In the next chapter, I will point out how the exclusion delusion derailed the Reading First program, which put about $6 billion into reading instruction from 2002 to 2008. If we learn the right lesson from that failure, the new round of attention being given to the so-called science of reading might not go to waste. 
This concludes the eighth episode of the Agentic Schools Manifesto. If you would like to gain access to the illustrations, the footnotes, the appendices, and the bibliography, the PDF and illustrated video versions of the book are available as membership benefits when you join Deeper Learning Advocates for $5 per month or more at dladvocates.org forward slash donate. If you would like more information about the catalytic pedagogy philosophy, how self-determination theory applies in education, and what it will take to transform education systems around the globe, check out my other website, holisticequity.org. There, under the Tools tab, you will find a variety of valuable ways to either deepen your understanding or apply that understanding in your school. Thank you for your kind attention.